Welcome to the AgTech and Food and Beverage Monthly BC webinar. Uh, for those of you who have done this before, uh, it's a slight change and adjustment to what we previously would do and how we would host these events. Um, keep in mind, this is, is recorded, so we could share it later, so just uh, bear in mind. But it is slightly different than the previous webinar formats. Before, it was just me talking. Now, we're doing a more of a standard uh, Zoom call-in, so it makes it a little bit easier for the audience or if anyone wants to ask questions if free feel free to do so most of those on the call today is probably going to be a combination of both startups investors some corporations again this is recorded so you're welcome to sit in while you can and you can call in later or if you miss the meeting we can uh this will be shared later as well so that way you have a chance to consume everything um, and if anything else, uh, we'll also be sharing probably materials a little bit later. But we'll jump right into it. Uh, I have about probably 50 slides to present. It's going to be uh, for the next 30, 45 minutes. And then after that, we're going to try to jump into we have a couple founders that are going to be presenting today as well. So um, we'll jump right into it. So what is the venture capital webinar? I think there's a handful of people that are relatively new to this. This is something we've done since 2019. Traditionally, what we did was we took at the entire industry as a whole, try to map all startups globally within an industry, at least as much as we can. We used to do more lengthy due diligence reports that was just mostly text that talks a little bit more about product level innovation. And then we would do these uh, webinars pre-pandemic, it used to be in person. Uh, where we talk a little bit more about um, uh, share both the data, the research, but also have um, the ability to meet others also interested in the ecosystem, understand you know um, uh, uh, some of the trends that are happening and actually have a dialogue and discussion. Now, post pandemic, it's moved to a virtual format, but it also makes it a little bit easier. It's um, especially talking with investors that are based internationally. We're changing this. This event used to be one big data report on an entire industry that we would do maybe once every other month or quarter. That's a lot of information and almost too much uh, to consume in a two hour meeting. So instead, we're going to actually split that up into multiple monthly events. Uh, so we have one for this is the agriculture and food and beverage technology. We have one for healthcare and logistics. If you're interested in participating in the other ones, let me know. And then later we'll probably add a couple more industrial tech, and then we will still do one-off events uh, as well. So that does um, uh, uh, slightly changing the model a little bit, but um, it'll make it a lot easier uh, for those in the audience because um, it's a little bit bite-sized information as a whole, and you'll get an understanding of that in just a little bit. So real quick, who am I? I just run US investments for MBI Ventures, which is a corporate venture capital arm of Telcom Indonesia. Uh, Telcom Indonesia is one of Southeast Asia's largest conglomerates. Essentially, we have about, a, at this point, this information is a little bit old that's on the slide, but we have about a billion dollars under management. A lot of the categories we talk about, we're interested in investing into. We are a synergy-based investor. So most of the companies that we're looking towards working with and hopefully trying to work with is to try to bring them to Indonesia and leverage our uh, state-owned enterprise and corporations and all of our subsidiaries and other state-owned enterprises to help those companies grow. So if you're interested in collaborating, let me know. Um, there's also one of the things that we're launching here that is called the Corporate Innovation Network. Over the last, since 2019, we have about 900 different uh, corporations and investors that participated in a lot of the research and the content that we have disseminated. Um, probably we're putting together more of a formal group that makes it a little bit easier for corporations specifically that want to have a little bit more deeper conversation about technology companies uh, that would benefit one another. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know. Um, but we're going to jump into the presentation. I'm going quick, but feel free to um, uh, ask uh, any questions throughout the phone call? Um, uh, the um, one thing that I'll probably have you guys do as well, mute yourself, but um, the agenda today, we're going to go quickly over, uh, we're going to do a quick uh, agriculture industry overview. 
similar to those you've attended before. It's uh, more or less, um, how do I define the agriculture and food and beverage industry as a whole based on the startups that we've tracked? Um, it has more macro level financial insights and more or less helps you understand where money flows. Um, it's a lot of detailed information, so you may have to look into it a little bit later. Um, but that just helps set the tone. We're talking about farm software category uh, today. Um, and those, that specifically is for both farm management and imagery. I'll define a little bit more about what that means and how that kind of how we got there from the agriculture and food and bev industry as a whole. So we'll talk a little bit more about the product level of where is the innovation happening, how are those categories defined, the goal of that is to help the audience have a better understanding of what does it mean to have a farm, what is farm management, how does that actually split apart, what are some companies doing at a product level, what do they actually offer, um, so that way that as a group you have an understanding of where you might want to be spending your time uh, and where might there be some interesting product innovation that uh, as an investor you might be interested in. Uh, and then after that, there's a handful of companies that are fundraising within these two categories that uh, you just have as a list. Um, and if you're interested in those companies, feel free to reach out directly or, at, you know, reach out to me and I can make the introduction. And then finally, uh, we have some presentations uh, from a, a few founders that are participating in the call today. They, were, they are highlighted within these categories, both farm management and imagery. We're super excited about um, not only what they do, they, we've already highlighted them within this report and previous reports, um, but having a little bit more, uh, giving them the opportunity to kind of share a little bit more about their product, why it's unique, um, and allow some questions from the audience too. So that'll make it a little bit easier of kind of breaking this entire industry of agriculture down into an individual company and why these individual companies are important. To get there, it takes a lot. Um, so hopefully this presentation structures it a little bit better and gives you the confidence, especially when looking at some of the companies that are presenting a little bit later. That being said, let's start off with the agriculture industry overview. Um, uh, and by the way, again, feel free to uh, uh, ask any questions if you feel um, uh, throughout the presentation. I'm going to go relatively quick because I have a short amount of time and I want to give uh, founders a, enough time to present their products. Uh, but feel free to jump in or send a question. And if we don't get to it, we'll, we'll address it at the end. Uh, what is the agriculture and food and beverage industry? Uh, if you look at companies around 2016 to present that have raised any type of uh, capital, uh, it's about 5,000 companies across 18 major categories, about $120 billion in aggregate funding. Is this everything? No, uh, but it tried to, my goal is to try to include all companies that I could possibly find. Um, if this does not include cannabis products, software, this does not include financial products for the farming industry, uh, this also, these 18 major categories, it's a combination of both uh, farming, agriculture, food and beverage, but it also gets into uh, restaurant solutions. Uh, we have, there's media products in there um, and a few others. So it's, it's pretty wide um, uh, reach. But um, uh, in most of these companies, by the way, that are tracked of the 5,000, only 39% of them are actually based in the United States. This kind of uh, slide gives a, uh, a kind of a, a okay overview of where a lot of the, some of the other companies are mapped, but not foolproof. Um, but just to kind of give you perspective, uh, majority of the companies are actually not from the United States, which is different from a lot of the categories that we do track, or it tends to be most companies are from the US and handful abroad. Um, the category that we actually want to zoom in at, so we're starting from a really, really high level, agriculture, food, and beverage, zooming in now on farming software. And this is what this, uh, this event is going to be focused on. Um, and we're actually, farming software actually splits up into five subcategories <laughs> that, uh, that I, I would more or less categorize of the companies that I think are providing software for farmers. Uh, they either fall into kind of one of these major five, and those five break into a couple other subsections of these subcategories. So it is 
a massive net. But I want to zoom in, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about imagery and, and farm management tools. There's nothing really too um, uh, 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 that stands out significantly when it comes to uh, statistics, just to kind of give you a rundown of what these columns actually mean so you can look it through it later. Uh, funding is the total aggregate funding of all the companies that are tracked within that space. And number is the companies that are actually the quantity of companies that are providing that product. Uh, the average funding is just relatively the average quantity of funding that each of those 68 startups, for example, have raised. Um, the exit percentage is companies that have uh, um, uh, exited or been acquired have gone public uh, relative to the total number of startups within that category. Um, the close percentage is more or less the companies that have closed relative to the total. Watch index, we have spreadsheets that kind of Mark, what are the companies that are the most interesting and that you should be paying attention to as an investor within those categories? Um, the watch index is kind of more of a gauge of where you should probably be spending your time um, looking into. And so um, that's just the number of quantities that you should pay attention to relative to the total and strategic indexes, uh, startups that have, are raising or have raised money from either an agriculture company or a tier one VC. So it's a little bit more zeroed in on where is the industry investing its money um, relative to the total number of startups in the industry. And then average valuation is just a different way of looking at average funding. Based on the average funding, what is generally the average valuation of companies within the space? You'll notice that for farm software, uh, most of the average funding is around, it's $9 million. It's, it's uh, relatively, lower than the industry total. And, you know, if you look at all the startup categories that we've mapped, um, it is, uh, the average funding is actually uh, a lot lower than, um, uh, than normal. But this is partly because a lot of these companies are abroad. Um, and what that means is that most startups in the United States have average funding is much higher than what is actually abroad. There's nothing else outside of the ordinary when it comes to what are um, exit trends or close. I think it's pretty average. The, the benchmark that we've seen for almost every industry, not outside of agriculture, it's around 10% companies get acquired. Um, uh, around 4% of companies close, so that seems relatively average. Uh, but obviously, we're talking about imagery and farm management today because it seems to have the most interest, especially from, from the watch index and strategic index. So we're going to jump into that and a little bit more specifics. Um, so let's talk about farm management. What is farm management? Well, I think farm management, generally at a very high level, is companies that are providing software that primarily helps farmers manage the farm's life cycle or the crop's life cycle. Uh, it's pretty broad and generic way of describing it, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on what it means. But um, these are mostly companies that have a variety of different software modules that more or less just tell farmers what they shouldn't do and, and how to manage operations. It's pretty vague, but we'll get into it. When you look at farm management as a whole, of those 74 companies, I said around 50% of those companies you probably should be paying attention to. Of those 50%, those are what are the logos here that we're highlighting. So these are the companies that you probably want to be uh, be aware of. Um, there are, if you want the full list of companies, you can email me afterwards. But uh, just for your sake, this is what you should be looking into. Farm management actually breaks up into, I think, three major subsections. And we're going to talk about each one. Um, there's general management, there's specific management, and there's farm networks. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those actually mean. Um, uh, and uh, what are some product level innovations at each one of those subsections that uh, make and, and define those subsections and also what you should be kind of watching for. Just real quick, especially for the investors, um, based on the companies that have been acquired uh, within the space, uh, whether it's mostly just M&As, 
uh, and there's one IPO here. Current valuations, um, it seems like it's at ranges. It seems like it would be hovering around that $100 million mark. It doesn't seem like farm management achieves billion dollar outcomes, for example. Farmer's Edge was one use case in 2021 where they went public at around a $600 million valuation but their current uh, market cap sits at 60. Uh, but you also, if you look at the revenue, they're doing around $7 million in annual recurring revenue. So just be wary on, and, and this is not surprising based on the average valuations of, of these startups within this category, the exit price for companies within this space is gonna be around that $100 million mark. Most of the companies that are those 74 that were shown in the slide, they're pretty spread abroad. So it's not just, really focused in, in on the United States. Um, they're, they're quite a bit across both Europe, Asia, even South America. So general management, the one of the subsections of farm management. Uh, how would, what is general management? And you can kind of see from the description, it's more software that has a variety of different tool sets that help farmers manage their crop life cycle, but it's not really specifically focused on an individual crop type, uh, nor does it have a uh, sp uh, specific use case or consumer that they're trying to target. It seems a little bit more general or broad, uh, working with a variety of different crops. A lot of these companies, if you actually look at them, it's not one product, it's a combination of software modules that help farmers uh, again, manage operations, manage finances, uh, manage uh, the crop life cycle, et cetera. Why I included both farm management and farm imagery categories as a whole into one presentation today is primarily because they overlap a lot. A lot of the companies in the farm management category, for example, use a lot of imagery uh, to both analyze and provide insights and help with the management and the operations of crops. Uh, they're not, I didn't categorize them as imagery companies because that is not their core focus. Um, the, the bigger trends, uh, just an, an, an important takeaway for this category that you'll, you'll see is a lot of the companies are trying to highlight that they have the ability to help farmers either automate tasks or uh, uh, um, uh, be able to predict yields or outcomes or be helped more or less just automate some of these processes that farmers would go through. And so this is something that uh, um, is, uh, if you look at this space, it's, it's pretty broad. What are the actual primary functions of most of the companies within the farm general management subsection? So if you go to their websites for every single one of these companies and you look at a lot of their software modules that they offer to the farmers, this is at a product level what it looks like. And you'll notice uh, this uh, dotted highlighted box. These are the major, if you almost all of these companies on the left-hand side here that are featured, all of them offer very, very similar uh, uh, software modules. Some more in depth and more unique tools than others, but for the most part, it's pretty straightforward. It's everything from managing field activities, the back office, there's always a business intelligence dashboard, Almost all of them have some form of satellite imagery component added into it. There is this crop life cycle management tool. Um, there's a lot that goes into logistics and tracing as well, both on inputs and then also um, helping and collaborating with more of the downstream players for farmers. Um, managing machines. I mean, it's just every, uh, every touch point that a farmer goes through, this is majority of what companies are offering here. So, it's again, it's a combination, a group of software modules as opposed to one product. And again, there's, if you go through each companies, this include all of the primary functions, but you'll notice that there's a handful of other things that companies tend to tack on as a feature or an additional tool set, whether it's managing vineyards, whether it's managing livestock, um, it's a combination of, it's just a mix of software that kind of gets thrown into the mix. These are just pictures of examples of startups from on the left-hand side, what those products actually are and what they kind of look like, just for reference when I'm referring to this. In the past, I just had text and it's a little bit much not as enjoyable to consume and also understand uh, what I'm referring to. Um, this makes it a little bit, life a little bit easier. But the other thing I wanted to highlight, so for every category and subject set that we're gonna go through today, we're gonna talk on the product primary functions. Next, we're gonna go through software, features and services, and then after that, the primary customers. The goal of that is really to help you understand 
how every single company that is highlighted here, how they're trying to differentiate themselves. So on the primary functions, how you differentiate yourself, it seems like it's gonna be a variety of software modules um, and whether or not you can practically help the farmer operate and manage their uh, uh, all different operations. <clears throat> and, and, and it seems like that is the trend. On the software side, there's a handful of companies that really stand up by trying to offer additional IoT devices or tools to integrate with, whether it's farm equipment or different devices to help again with the automation of managing farm um, operations. Again, we talked a little bit earlier, one of the bigger trends for general management is that um, uh, to automate different operations uh, within the farm. And then there's another big trend that it seems like a lot of these companies are highlighting here as a, a really big feature of their product is traceability and being able to understand both the inputs and the life cycle of their crop, especially for uh, their partners downstream that they work with. Um, I'm gonna to try to go a little bit quicker. Uh, I apologize, but I wanna make sure that we have time for those that are presenting today. But on the farm management category, most of companies within the space are targeting farmers. A lot of the software modules have practical use cases for other ag tech stakeholders. And you can kind of get an example of that here. And if you go into their product tool set, you'll see that how they, on their website, they actually discuss how they're you know, going after financial stakeholders in addition to farmers, um, et cetera. Most of the companies within the general management category are focused on industrial large enterprises, not these small and mom uh, pop shops you know, or emerging market farmers. This is really, these products are for industrial farmers. These are the companies you'd be paying attention to. I think one of them is gonna be presenting today that we've highlighted within this section. Oopsies. Um, the next subsection is the specific farm management. It's pretty straightforward. It's oper farm operation tool sets, but more specific to um, an actual crop, whether it's vineyards, grains, insects, for example, trees, fruits, and nuts. Um, a lot of the similar functionality, it's just these companies tend to have a little bit more uh, build their models that are modules that are much more focused on these specific uh, crop types. And these are the companies you should be paying attention to. Uh, again, I will share these slides afterwards so you'll have access to this. And then farm networks. So this is the last subsection of farm management. Farm networks, you could probably argue with me that a lot of these companies are marketplaces, and I would agree with you. But most of these companies are trying to target emerging market farmers. Um, so most farmers that are in third world countries, as an example, in Indonesia, most rice farmers majority of the ecosystem is made up of a farmer that owns maybe a half an hectare of land and is very rural. Uh, and um, that is basically the entire majority of rice within Indonesia is grown, for example, from um, a very fragmented farming ecosystem of mostly smallholder farmers. A lot of these companies, when I call say farm networks are kind of catering to those types of farmers. And a lot of what they do is they provide a lot of mostly a mobile application and it's content and it's advisory support and it's imagery that helps with farmers more or less just understand how they can improve yields, manage different operations. It's not too complex, but they tend to layer a lot of marketplaces or services, financial services or other services to more or less monetize that ecosystem um, because most of those farmers are not gonna be paying for a subscription service and what does that actually look like? It, most of them, the reason why I put it as a farm network category is for, for a lot of these companies, you could argue with me that they are marketplaces, is a lot of them provide a mobile application that helps farmers understand um, ways that they should improve uh, uh, their crop. And even a good chunk of them actually also include more of a social network component as well, or a forum that allows farmers to communicate with each other in ways that they can improve operations. And almost all of them have some form of marketplace integrated, whether it's for inputs or whether that's from for helping them sell their product to different buyers. There's not really uh, huge software features that uh, really stand out. There are a handful of companies that offer imagery, really cool imagery solutions that in support for farmers. Uh, there's others, especially those who have a social network or a forum. They try to track kind of the general sentiment of farmers 
and also um, they can pull insights from you know what farmers are inputting within the mobile application to see broadly how the ecosystem of farmers are doing but for the most part how these companies monetize is through a variety of services and that is marketplaces we talked about earlier there's financial services everything from like soil testing advisory a lot of these companies also have some type of agents or centers especially in rural areas that can integrate or you know interface with farmers um etc and again most tend to focus in on selling directly to farmers a lot of them actually also provide tool sets that work with other ag tech stakeholders um i'm going to move relatively quickly um just so that we are staying on track i apologize i know i'm going fast um but i think we have an awesome list of startups that are presenting today so we will get into that in a little bit uh the startups that you should probably be paying attention to in this space are listed here actually two of them are going to be presenting today um i'm super excited about it great so that's farm management I hope that gives a broader understanding of when we talk about how, what is farm management, you know, it's 74 companies that split up into three major subsections. Generally, the big takeaway here is that it is a group of software modules that uh, help all different operations and how startups differentiate is either the tool set that they provide, whether it's the simplicity or the depth, or whether it's the specific on crops. And then there's a whole different market of uh, products that are more focused on emerging markets, small farmers, giving them the tool sets that they need to succeed, but figuring out ways how they can monetize on top of that. Um, and both have very interesting and unique approaches. And I think that's how, if you're looking into farm management space, um, uh, here are the companies that you definitely wanna be paying attention to. Now we're gonna shift gears over to imagery. Now, imagery is um, really startups that utilize different forms of images or imagery and to generate insights on crops. A lot of companies within the farm software category leverage imagery. These companies are specific and labeled as imagery related startups because uh, uh, the, their focus on leveraging imagery and the software tool set that they built around imagery is much more significant, I think, than if you know a traditional farm management tool that's just pulling in satellite imagery provides some really broad, general, high-level insights. A lot of the companies here, their major focus is imagery and then build out applications from that. Uh, imagery splits up into, I think, three major subsections. If you look at of the 68 companies that are in this category that is tracked, um, generally how they actually split up. Uh, the exit percentage for companies within imagery is actually relatively high, uh, not high, but uh, higher than the average and higher than the average for the industry. So there seems like to be a lot more interest. And also both from the watch and strategic index, there's a lot of interest within imagery um, within uh, um, uh, from the investors, both strategic and I think uh, overall. So this is definitely a category that you might wanna spend time into and in looking at a lot of these companies. Uh, from the companies that have exited, uh, this is all public information that I'm able to search for or find the companies that don't share the exit price or don't disclose the exit price. There's not much we can do. It does, based on a lot of the articles, it seems like this, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of dollar range seems like a, a good indicator of the valuation range for companies that do exit within the farm imagery category. Um, so just put that into perspective uh, when you are investing in this category to understand kind of generally where the outcomes are coming from. Um, uh, most of the companies are also pretty scattered for imagery, a little bit more on the US and, and Europe, but there's a lot of great companies abroad as well. Um, but let's jump into the major subsection, which I call crop analytics. Now crop analytics, uh, the easiest way to look at the companies that are highlighted here on the left, I think it kind of splits into two. The, you have the companies that tend to focus more on this picture on the top really highlights that, that really like to work with more satellite imagery and provide more broader insights and analytics on large swaths of land. And 
they tend to be less focused on individual farmers and more towards agriculture stakeholders. And they all very different tool set and technology um, and also very unique in ways in which they can generate insights based on satellite imagery. And then there's a handful of other companies that tend to focus a little bit more on providing a camera that's either on the ground, uh, a camera that is, um, whether it's on a drone or whether it's on a plane to get a lot more closer shot of actual crops. Those, a lot of these companies are more focused on really trying to analyze the health of crops, the performance, uh, any types of damages or things that they can change. But at the same time, uh, um, they tend to focus a lot more on the individual farmers as well. And the primary functions for both major categories of imagery startups tends to be here. It's everything from crop health, classification, damage. Can we understand um, how we should irrigate uh, these crops? Is there, uh, can we um, count both plants or weeds? Can we predict yields, et cetera? The difference between, um, you know, I think companies that use more satellite imagery uh, is tends to be more broader um, uh, insights like uh, that you kind of see on the right hand side here, um, as opposed to when it comes to on the left hand side it, for companies that are more on the ground, very focused on individual plants, it's really focusing in on the crop health specifically and, and helping a little bit more with um, uh, farmers with their operations about how they should be treating their, their crops. Um, where is the data coming from? For all this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, most companies, uh, it seems like they're not using their own uh, cameras. It seems like they're using third-party sensors or cameras and services, a handful of companies or space imagery. Uh, there's some big focus for a lot of companies is using hyperspectral cameras as a, a tool to more or less drive, generate the most insights from how to measure uh, some uh, uh, attract different trends across crop life cycle. Um, there's some more, even more use cases. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, but just an example of the data output. Uh, this is just a list of different types of company, you know, uh, feeds of information that typically comes from these data sources and what is actually a lot of these companies, what are they actually trying to track? And what is that, uh, what does the farmer actually receive? Um, the biggest unique software features in all of this tends to be uh, imagery capability. A lot of companies in this space really highlight their uh, um, ability to take both imagery, whether it's from the cameras that they provide or it's from other resources and being able to parse through that to un truly understand um, uh, and pull as much insights as they possibly can. There's a couple other you know, unique software features like general market intelligence or tools in which you can combine both imagery and other tool set, you know, data uh, inputs to generate insights. But for the most part, the, most of the companies here really focusing in on how they can leverage imagery in a way that uh, better than anyone else can. And it is really impressive for a lot of the companies that are within this space, especially um, uh, for the companies that are both on the satellite side or using satellite imagery and also the startups are using cameras that are doing more up-close pictures of crops. Now, again, those that are doing more up-close pictures of crops tend to focus more on directly of the farmers. Those that are doing more satellite imagery tend to work with more agriculture stakeholders, not as much in the farmers, um, but there is a, a handful of companies that do a combination of both. Uh, the companies that you should be paying attention to within the space are listed here. Uh, 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 we're moving perfectly on time. I know I'm going relatively quick, but we're, we're doing really great on time. Um, and we're going to jump into presentations here shortly. Uh, the next subsection of imagery is I call crop management. I know that already uh, is... You could argue with me that that's crop management. We just did farm management category. It could be, a lot of these companies could be listed here. The major difference between this section and I think the previous section on crop analytics for imagery 
is again, these are startups uh, that are trying to provide imagery solutions, not just for analytics, which is a lot of the previous companies that we just saw in the other subsection, heavily focused on insights and analytics and imagery, you know, what they can pull from the imagery that they have. Companies that are more on the crop management side, these are startups that tend to both do very similar things, pull a lot of insights from the imagery that they have. They are heavily focused on imagery, which is why they're within the imagery category. But a lot of a big focus of theirs is um, uh, they tend to add a couple more software modules that help not just with generating and pulling insights for farmers, but being able to say, okay, from that insights, here's some action levels or action items that we can take um, or tools, dashboards or tools that we can provide to help a little bit more with the operations or managing that crop itself. Um, and a good example of this, some of those functions, if you go through this list of companies here on the left side, you see a combination of, I mean, there's, there's this, you know, crop monitoring and performance that already exists within the analytics category as well. You seem to see a little bit more of collaboration tools. You see more field management applications. And there's, you know, modules for things like pesticide management, or irrigation management. Some getting further is input recommendations. A lot of the crop analytics categories and startups do the same thing as well. Um, uh, the primary difference here is that these companies tend to have, a, it seems like a little bit more uh, modules that are tacked on on top of the imagery insights. Data sources, also very, very similar of how it's collected. A variety of different cameras, satellite imagery, sensors. Um, some of these companies tend to also highlight pulling more information from a variety of sensors, not just imagery. Also a handful of companies, I think both in the crop analytics, but also here, they also have, uh, they do surveys so to validate the in the insights from that they can pull from the imagery, they actually go out to the field and double check that as well to make sure that the, the, the uh, what they're analyzing from the imagery is correct or not correct, and then kind of adjust from there. Uh, and the data output, again, this is not, uh, this is just examples, uh, not all of them. There's so much of insights that can be pulled and you saw that from the other slide as well. But uh, this is what these, a lot of these companies are highlighting as the primary output. And again, the software features are very similar as well. It's imagery capabilities, how much depth that they can pull from the imagery that they have. Also a big focus on imagery lately has been um, uh, being able to generate insights, carbon insights and uh, to understand uh, and kind of fuel uh, this um, carbon credit marketplace uh, that's really popping up. And you'll see a handful of companies that uh, can try to generate and measure, uh, I think generally broadly sustainability insights. Um, on top of that, a lot of these companies also offer a handful of tools and services, uh, both marketplaces, financial tools, et cetera. So again, just a handful more modules and services that exist, which is why I put them in a separate category and they called it crop management. And again, no, no surprise, most of these companies are focused on farmers. They have a handful of modules that, and tools that work with different agriculture stakeholders uh, based on the imagery that they're working with. So it's kind of a, a good blend. Companies that we, you should definitely be paying attention to are listed here. Uh, we have a few companies that are within the imagery category that are uh, presenting today too. So I'm super excited about it. But that's it. That's a high level overview of both how we went from the agriculture industry as a whole 5,000 companies to kind of zeroing in on 500 that are farm software. And then from farm software zeroing in on around 150 that are within imagery and management that tend to get a lot more attention from investors. And then being able to understand at a product level, which somehow they break apart in farm management and imagery, the subsections of those, and what are each of those companies doing at a high level uh, product level, on both on not only what is their primary function, how they're collecting data, but at the same time, um, ways in which that they are providing unique software service features to stand out from each other and their primary customers. So it's, it's simplifying it a little bit more and structuring this massive ecosystem. Uh, the companies that are fundraising are listed here. Uh, again, I'll send up afterwards. You can kind of get a general feel and scale of their size already. Also where these companies are located. 
Um, again, feel free to reach out to them directly, or you can ask me and then we can try to make an introduction if the founder is interested in chatting with you. Um, and then we're gonna jump into startup presentations. So the startups that are gonna to present today are both from the farm management and imagery category. Um, these are the list of startups that are presenting today. Uh, they're all fantastic. They're all listed within these reports. You'll see their logos and where we categorize them. They may agree with me. They may disagree with their categorization. Um, but uh, I wanted to have a chance for the startups themselves to speak a little bit more on their product. Uh, even though I can give you some high-level insights, and we just quickly went through those, um, uh, the thing is, is having a little bit more um, uh, engagement from directly from the founders, I think it'll give you a better perspective on some of these products that we talked about before, the categories. And then we have about 15 minutes per company, per startup. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to run through the presentation. And then if any in the audience have a question, feel free to speak up. This is a traditional Zoom format. So you have the ability to ask questions if you'd like. I may cut the presentation and off if it goes a little bit too long because I want to make sure we get through everyone because all these companies are fantastic and I don't want you to miss any one of them. Um, with that being said, uh, let's jump into the first company. Actually, I know Jack, we said you were going to be the first one, but Reza is about to jump on a plane right now. Uh, so we, we uh, I'm going to actually have him uh, uh, from Interplant, he's going to present first. Um, and then we'll we'll jump into the list that we, we talked about before. I have sh made it so that you can share your screen, Reza. So feel free to jump into it. All right. Yep. Uh, give me one moment here, confirming that everyone can hear me and that the background noise isn't too much of an issue. Um, awesome. I'll just jump right in. Um, so so my name is Reza Bloomer. I'm head of business development at Interplant. Sorry that our founder and CEO Shelley couldn't be here today. Um, a little bit of background, we're a three-year-old uh, seed technology company based out of Davis, California. We're developing smart seeds that signal their needs in real time, hopefully to reduce chemical use and, and increase crop yields. Um, so before I get started, uh, I'd like, I guess, to pose one question to the group, um, and that's, has anyone killed a houseplant? Um, because if the answer is yes, uh, you're, you're definitely not alone. Um, farmers around the world have the same challenge, um, but at a much larger scale. Um, and what they do to mitigate that risk is apply chemicals uh, in advance on entire fields. And the reason is because they just don't have a reliable way to identify specific problems before damage is inflicted. The biggest challenge for farmers is, is identifying specific stresses um, and identifying them early. Uh, it's really guessing game. And so usually by the time crop stress is detected or visible to the human eye, uh, the damage has already been done and it's too late to, to really do anything about it. So what do farmers do? Every year, farmers in, in the US consistently use uh, lose 20% of their, their yields to, to pathogens and at the same time spend $250 billion on pesticides and, and fertilizers to try to, to, to ameliorate some of that. Um, about 30% is, is misapplied or overapplied, which ends up polluting our water and soil and food supply. So this risk reduction strategy of prophylactically applying chemicals in a blanket fashion clearly isn't working. Um, so the question is, what if plants could tell us uh, exactly what they need? Um, and that's what Interplant is doing. We, we bring in the missing data by recoding plants to signal optically when and they're thirsty, uh, when they're being attacked by pathogens, or when they need more nutrients, um, effectively transforming entire fields into living sensors um, so that farmers can acquire the knowledge they need to make the right agronomic decisions in a timely manner. Um, so in practice, what that means is, you know, enabling farmers to, to, to understand what the plant needs and when, and uh, provide optimal care to each plant based on those individual needs. Uh, so how exactly we do that? Truth is we know a lot about plants. I work with a lot, a lot of plant molecular biologists and plant pathologists who obsess over how plants are reacting 
to stress and to their environment. Um, and plants like humans have unique immune system reactions that are activated within hours of the emergence of a stress. Um, we effectively at Interplant tap into those natural response pathways by combining the native genetic regulatory elements with what we call our, our sensor genes, these fluorescent proteins. Um, so on the left, you'll see two tomato crops side by side. In both plants, we've induced drought conditions um, by, by, um, by straining them um, without water. And um, when looked at through a spectrometer, you'll see that the control crop on the left is not visible. And then the interplant crop on the right is, is signaling that, that it's stressed with, with the glowing. Um, this, is, this is within 24 hours of, of the induction of the drought stress. Um, so in short, we use biotech um, and these fluorescent proteins and, and have found a, a really cool way for plants to create a, a scalable and easy to collect signal um, that can be read from, from as far away as satellites um, or, or, or proximally from, from tractor booms or drones. Um, so the traits embedded in the seed, which means no changes to the farmer's operations and no additional work. Farmers just plant the seeds as they always do and, and harvest the data. Um, uh, which, which will provide via remote sensing. Um, and this means that farmers can start to shift away from the prophylactic blanket applications and really uh, treat plants on a crop by crop basis, do localized treatment to be more efficient with their applications um, and hopefully uh, improve the overall health of fields and increase yields. Um, so, so why are we so committed to this vision? The answer is because we believe, you know, uh, plant by plant farming is, is the future. Um, we're living at, in an era where plants are sort of at the center of everything. Um, a shift from the indiscriminate application of, 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 of synthetic fertilizers and chemicals to, you know, more precision care, um, sense and act technologies, um, individualized crop care. Um, and a connected farm hopefully will be powered by our smart seeds um, so that we can remove some of the risk and uncertainty from farming and, and do so at scale in, in, in every plant. Um, this new reality is going to be better for farmers. Um, you know, we've done the math and can share supporting models, uh, you know, 20% higher yields, 30% less chemicals, uh, making farming more profitable and sustainable and product productive for the, for the farmer. Um, and, th and then obviously it's also better for the planet. You know, we could remove up, up to half a billion metric tons of, C of CO2 equivalent by eliminating the unnecessary chemical production um, as well as use, um, and then increasing soil carbon sequestration with, with more biodiversity in, in our soils. Um, so if you're intrigued, please visit us online. Um, plenty of resources and videos on our website. Of course, I'm also happy to chat. So if there's interest in learning more about investment opportunities or, or, or partnerships, if you're in the industry, uh, please reach out to me directly. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it, Reza. And I know I, I included you within the imagery category, and I think you're one of the more uh, unique uh, examples because you're coming from more of the biotech side, so you could probably be categorized yep. there. Uh, anyone from the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in and, and, and ask Reza if you have um Otherwise, I'll probably ask a question here. Looks like Bruce has one. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, yeah, I'll be speaking shortly. We're in the industry. This would be fascinating. Do you know what crops have you worked with so far? Yeah, so we started um, with research crops, Arabidopsis and tomatoes. Um, those produce a lot of seed, are easier to transform. We can grow them here in California. Um, but uh, from a commercialization standpoint, it's, it's, it's a focus on cash crops and row crops. So soybeans first, that's where we've completed plant transformations. That's what we plan to go to market with um, and what we've started field trials for. Um, and from there, natural progression into corn, we've got you know, early research done on canola and cotton. So, so um, uh, commodity crops that have GM adoption today. Okay, thank you. Yep. So for example, what is some of the um, is the uh, ways in which you engineer the plant, is it just kind of a, a more of a binary system where the plant is stressed or it's not? Or is there other ways in which you can engineer the plant to show other aspects of what's yep. the issues they may have or what they might need? Yep. Yeah, I think the, the, the real value is not only that the signal is early, 
um, it's the biological reaction, right? So it's going to be much earlier than, you know, a reduction in biomass or a reduction in chlorophyll fluorescence, which, you know, we're, we're, we're um, tracking today with traditional indexes. So it's early, but it's also specific. So we're going to have unique colors, unique fluorescent signals for different stresses, uh, probably broad categorizations of stresses. So a fungal pressure, an insect pressure, a nitrogen deficiency. Um, so, so, so yeah, there'll, there'll be um, early and specific indicators uh, and it likely will be binary to start. Um, but the, the truth is that, you know, with the right detection equipment, um, you can start to see um, uh, it, it at a, in a gradated fashion, right? Uh, stress, is, uh, uh, stress increases, peaks, and then dissipates depending on when and how you treat uh, the crop. So uh, with the right equipment, we can start to see the number of genes that are activated and that that'll correspond to a stronger signal or a weaker signal. Great. Well, Reza, I really appreciate you jumping on and uh, doing the phone call. I know you're gonna about to jump on a plane right now, so I'll let you go, but thank you so much. And if you have any questions, um, I think uh, Reza will follow. Well, uh, we have your email address. I think we saw that on the slide. So if anyone has questions, they'll reach out. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Kyle. Uh, yeah, anyone, please reach out. Be happy to chat. Thank you, Renzo. Cool. Well, moving on, uh, the next company that I wanted to highlight um, is Perennial. Uh, Jack, he's the CEO and co-founder. I believe Jack is here. Um, hey, Kyle, good morning. Jack, how you doing? Good. Thanks for thanks for having us. Absolutely. Jack is also within the imagery category. I think they have a really impressive uh, um, software technology stack, but at the same time, your approach, when we talked about the, some of the trends that's happening in imagery is understanding carbon sequestration. I think you guys are also really leaning into that as well. And then your platform actually also works outside of agriculture ecosystem, I think with you know more industrial stakeholders, et cetera. So, a little bit more interesting, but it's the floor is yours, Jack. Thanks, Kyle, and uh, grateful for everyone's time. So, you know, at Perennial, we're building the carbon removal platform for soil. So when we think about the carbon markets overall, you know, it's estimated that about 85% of global emissions are covered under net zero commitments. And so really the problems that every major corporate faces is a trusted supply of carbon offsets. There's far more demand than there is supply. And so our thesis in this space is we believe that soil, agricultural soils, is the largest untapped carbon sink. And so if we can untap that supply through measurement, reporting, and verification, then we will in fact have through our software uh, a touch on the largest supply of carbon offsets that would be feeding into some of the corporate buyers. And so our vision as a company is to unlock soil as the largest carbon sink. And we're doing that by building rigorous standards and technology to underpin the generation, verification, and transaction of these carbon offsets. And so we think about, you know, why is the supply of offsets from soil, and this includes nature-based solutions overall, you know, pretty, pretty small today? Well, it goes back to measurement and, and methodologies, basically the way that you generate an offset. So today with soil and agriculture, the real limiting factor to scaling these sustainability programs is measurement. Today, most companies rely on physical soil sampling. So you can imagine that you have to walk into every field, collect dirt, put it in a plastic bag and ship it to a lab and wait weeks for that analysis. The important point is not even um, the cost or the labor that's required to do this. It's actually the fact that it's not rigorous enough to underpin a financial asset that um, some of these Fortune 500 corporates are going to create. So the idea is what we've developed is the ability to using satellites environmental conditions, and also a physical sampling library of our own that we've built up. We map soil carbon on every field in the world. Today, our focus is really on the US and Australia. And what we do is we use those measurements to monitor carbon levels in soil. And then we're able to basically verify carbon offset generation. To talk a little bit more about that technology, basically what we do is we look at environmental data to classify different fields. And we've developed a machine learning model which is pretty much pattern recognition. You have a bunch of physical samples, you match that up with satellite data, and then for every about five meters in a field, you basically measure soil carbon and you can aggregate that information into an accurate field level, supply shed, 
or, or country level estimate. We really started with soil carbon, but as we progressed as a company, we realized that you know we don't want to be a single pipe that measures soil carbon into someone else's platform. We wanna be the platform that underpins sustainability within agriculture. So we've built out the ability to look at net field level emissions for agriculture. So this is soil carbon plus nitrous oxide plus methane. So when you think about the product build out, um, you know, as, as Kyle was saying, uh, most of our time is actually really spent on software and business development with our clients. Um, you know, we, we really aren't just kind of an, an imagery and data provider. And so the way to think about it is we have a stack of environmental data, um, almost like a Zillow, which classifies a field. And then you have uh, different folks in the agricultural supply chain who are interested in this data. So you have people who are buying land. Land is going to be classified based on environmental data very soon, it already is, and we have clients there. We have clients that are big banks. We have clients who are ag lenders, um, fertilizer companies, seed dealers, et cetera. The way to think about this company, Perennial, is that for agricultural companies, we have a platform that supports insetting in scope three, where they can reduce the emissions tied to the ingredients that they're purchasing. For corporates outside of agriculture, Perennial is verifying the supply of carbon offsets, working with ag companies who are product developers of these offsets to help them verify and measure these offsets for corporates to meet their net zero commitments. When we think about sustainability programs that have popped up in agriculture, there's really a bifurcation between carbon offsets and insets. So some ag companies have sponsored carbon programs where they part pay farmers to perform practices that regenerate the soil planting cover crops in the off season, not tilling the soil, et cetera. So those are specifically where you're paying farmers to perform regenerative practices. These companies need an MRV, measurement reporting and verification. That's where Perennial comes in to help verify and be the data layer, almost like plaid with the financial system to make sure that those credits are generated. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have CPGs, grain processors, uh, et cetera, who are looking to simply measure and reduce the environmental footprint within that supply chain. And so that's where we're spending a lot more of our time because you can imagine that, that the way that a lot of food companies are thinking about this space is really nascent. I'll just add one other key thing because kind of like I caught some of your presentation, I think this is a really important um, you know, point for investors to think about in this space. Remote sensing in agriculture, especially in carbon markets, is not um, one size fits all. You know, everyone talks about how they use remote sensing, but it's actually very different applications. And so in our space, there's a big difference between outcome versus practice based. So when you look at companies like Hummingbird, Regrow, people who are doing amazing things in the industry, where they started and where their focus is, is on using satellite imagery to verify that a practice has occurred. They verify that tillage has, um, whether or not a field was tilled, they verify whether or not a cover crop was planted. We're outcome based. So we measure the actual outcome to soil carbon and net emissions based on those practices and regardless of those practices. And we feel this is very critical as we think about different SEC guidelines and as we think about um, emissions reporting, you know, we think that verification of practice, which stands up sustainability programs like a sustainable beer based on cover cropping, uh, you know, that that's not the future. The future is actually being able to measure emissions and see how that's changing. Um, so just to close up, uh, you know, in terms of go to market, as you know, Kyle said, we're B2B, we don't really work with farmers directly. Um, we want to be third party and non competitive to all of our clients, who are these major ad companies who own and manage the relationships with growers. And so from a fundraising standpoint, um, you know, we've raised about $25 million total in April, we closed an $18 million series A led by Tomasic and Bloomberg with participation from the Microsoft Climate Innovation Fund, Climate Tech BC, Mike Schroepfer, the former Meta CTO, and some others. So we're really excited about the fact that we have some pretty big investors who aren't just traditional ag tech investors, but people like Bloomberg in financial markets who understand that when you really look at this space about forest direct air capture, agricultural soils, when you look at the carbon market landscape, agricultural soils, and nature-based solutions need to be a part of the solution or else we're not going to be able to meet those net zero commitments. And for sure, from a financial standpoint, there's no way that these companies can meet their demand for carbon offsets. Awesome. No, I appreciate it, Jack. That's 
very clear and succinct. I don't even have any questions to follow up from that because I think you did fantastic at answering all of them. But uh, anyone from the audience have anything that they want to uh, ask Jack? Everyone's so shy, except for Bruce. Bruce, you're not shy. No, I'm just kidding. But cool. Well, Jack, uh, any other thing that you want to mention? Otherwise, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I would just add, you know, if anyone's interested, we've got a newsletter for interested investors that we send out every month. So you can either go to our website, um, email me directly, jack at perennial.earth, or Kyle has my contact as well. So cool. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Kyle. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Uh, the next person we're going to jump into is uh, Bruce. Uh, he is from Farmex. Bruce is the uh, chief operating officer, correct? Uh, um, and then yes, that's correct. Great. And then um, uh, Bruce, uh, Farmex is a part of the farm management. I categorize you within the farm management category. So stepping away from imagery for a second, but um, um, Farmex, I think, has in uh, kind of what I was talking about a little bit earlier within this ecosystem. There's a lot of companies that offer a handware handful of modules that are really impactful for the individual user. And I think um, Farmex is one of those companies where it's done uh, as a, a good and really interesting set of products and tools that uh, are practical for a customer. So Bruce, the floor is yours. Um, love to learn more about Farmex. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us into this and including us in your um, set of companies. I noticed you said we're in Redwood City. We've since moved a little further south to Mountain View, just down the peninsula. <clears throat> um, and there's my contact information if anyone's interested. We are fundraising right now, and we can talk about that. Um, we fit into the farm management and imaging spaces. And um, I'll go into a little bit more of that. In the past, we've always had satellite imaging, but we have just uh, acquired an autonomous vehicle uh, company that um, takes us into to, uh, ground vehicles and drones. And we'll talk more about it. I have a video at the end that shows off some of that. So we've always taken satellite imagery. We use uh, forecast uh, ET and we have a partnership with IBM. IBM acquired uh, um, Weather Underground and has uh, all that data coming into Watson. And they have some of the very best uh, localized weather forecasting uh, on the planet. So we use that for forecasting ET. We put pressure sensors in fields. So we get a 2D pressure monitoring map, shows us where your irrigation is functioning properly and where it's not. We have soil moisture probes that we put in the ground, and I'll talk a little more about that. And we build a 3D soil percolation model using our AI. So we, um, we look at all of these inputs and we can tell you exactly how much water needs to be added at each point in the field to hit the target uh, VWC, uh, volumetric water content that you need for your crops. Um, we put in direct plant health sensors. Um, let me make a comment. People who do one thing will tell you that their sensors are all you need. So a plant health sensor might be a dendrometer, an IR sensor, a stem water potential device that gets plugged into a tree. And the only problem is it's into a tree or it's focused on one little region like an IR sensor, what about 50 or 100 feet away? <laughs> and so what we find is the imaging is a wonderful tool for looking across the field and taking this other sensor data and figuring out where um, it applies and where it doesn't apply and where we're, more work needs to be done. We then put a local weather station in each field or small set of fields, we have found that the local weather forecasting is off by enough. You're on the other side of the ridge from a Simis station and your weather is enough different that all of the forecasting is wrong. So we do that. 
Um, and as I said, we started with satellites. We now have a company that's part of Pharmax that will, will be doing um, 100 meter, 400 foot um, orthorectified imaging with drones. But then I'm going to give a video at the end to Samia Works, all right, with Zoom that shows uh, scouting, uh, for example, under the canopy in our orchards and uh, a meter above vineyards. And it's all done without GPS. It's done with uh, perceptive navigation so that it will operate in places where you can't get a reliable GPS signal. And it's accurate to the centimeter versus meters. Um, we take all of that, feed them into a set of AI models and come out with recommendations. Recommendations for things like irrigation scheduling. So we can say that here's what your average moisture in this field is right now from our sensors. Here's what the ET forecast is. Here's what the imaging data shows. And we recommend that you put, you know, one inch of, of additional irrigation on the field over the next two days. And you can click on a button and we will actually schedule it if you have our full automation. Okay, or you can then go and implement it by hand and we'll monitor what you do. Remember, we have pressure sensors in the field so we know exactly when you're irrigating and how much. So we'll give you the feedback that shows how good your irrigation is actually. We also take that data and now with the high-res imaging we're getting, the scouting that we get with our drones and then towards the end of this year or next year, ground vehicles, we will recognize pests, chemical deficiencies, uh, mold and mildew, and we will actually go and direct the spraying, weeding directly to where it's needed. Um, with full robotics. And I'll be demonstrating a little spraying application in the video. So the idea is here to um, build a whole platform that integrates all of these different sensor inputs into our models and drive that into actions. And we've focused very heavily in the last year to move away from um, just showing you an image or showing you a graph of the moisture in your ground to making very high level English and Spanish recommendations that explain what we see. And then you can click through to act on it, meaning automate it, or you can click through to drill down to understand why we think that. So when we say, here's a recommended irrigation, you can say, hmm, why? The plants look healthy. Click, and we'll show you the satellite image that led us to that conclusion and the soil moisture in the ground that shows that it's trending down below your, your minimum water content. And then you can go, oh, okay, schedule it and we will do it. So this is the future. And the idea is, uh, we all know, water is uh, becoming unavailable and very expensive. Um, labor here in uh, California, where we are, is um, <laughs> hard to find and getting more expensive. There's more state laws requiring, you know, limited time, minimum pay, um, overtime pay. So very difficult. So we, with our growers, we're not trying to eliminate jobs. We're trying to make the labor that you can find more effective because you just can't get enough of it. So I'll go a little bit into technology and then dive in on the imaging. We're moving everything technologically over to what we call energy harvesting. So eliminate batteries and um, tiny little solar panel, uh, feed supercapacitors. Uh, we, we're using LoRa as a local radio. We include, we embed uh, Bluetooth low energy. So you walk up to a device and talk to it, get the values out, turn valves on and off from your smartphone, and then uh, near field communication. And we use that, if you think about it, we may have a field with literally a thousand of our devices in it. We have a customer that is doing micro irrigation with 
literally 1,200 devices in one field, and that's only a small portion of the field. You can take your phone, tap it on a device, and talk just to that device. If I went BLE, I'd see 100 devices. Someday go into Costco and look at the devices on your BLE, and you're going to see hundreds and hundreds of them. How do I know which one I want to talk to? So that's where we bring in NFC. So we have this custom soil moisture probe. And if you can see the image on the right, on the far right is a competitive soil moisture probe. And each of those little circles is the volume of sensing that they do. And those big green ovals on the left are the volume that we do. So you can literally put one of our sensors between two drip lines in an almond orchard and see exactly how much moisture is in the root zone for a very large volume of the root zone. And so it's not fooled by a rock in the way or you know, uneven soil. It sees right through all of it. Um, then um, uh, uh, this is sort of our new tech rolling out the door now. We're in field trials on this, and it will be deployed towards the end of this year. Um, now, we've acquired an autonomous, autonomous vehicle company, and we are now starting to fly these drone flights. Um, this, uh, we've done the calculations, and we can give you um, two and a half to five centimeter pixels at a cost that's lower than a fixed wing image of the field at uh, half a meter. So uh, 50 centimeters or satellite at best is around three to 10 meters, depending on who you get the images from. And this is multi-spectral. Um, so we can do all of the same image processing and we can do scouting using this. The resolution is good enough that we can, and I'll show you a little bit more of that. Um, you know, this is the kind of data that we're getting. So we can, and we're building the models to automatically recognize problems in the field. So here we're in a similar space as C-Tree, for example, which focuses on uh, orchard, um, mostly citrus, but also on almonds. We also work in vineyards heavily. Um, and uh, let me, okay. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Yep. Okay. Before I dive in on, I'll start a, a video going. Um, any questions at this point? And can you see the uh, video? I can see the video, yes. Okay. So this video is a pair of drones cooperating with each other and um, spraying a vineyard in the hills here in the Bay Area uh, in a place called Woodside, uh, right up on the uh, Skyline Boulevard between the Bay and the ocean. And the field is at a 40 degree angle. And the way they spray it now is uh, laborers with backpack sprayers and, and gas masks go up and down the rows doing this. Actually, they come down the rows get collected at the bottom <clears throat> in, a, in a vehicle and, and truck back up to the top to go down the next. And it can take them three days to spray 30 acres of vineyard. So this is a spraying drone and it's got a tethered hose that runs to the, that keeps it from tangling. And then this uses and same height and same orientation within the rows that it's working on. And you can see on the drone, it's got LiDAR and a camera. And those are both used, actually a couple of cameras are uh, both used for the navigation in the device. And then the intermediate drone figures out where it has to stay to keep the right tension in the hoses to keep it. And that goes down to the ground where a pump truck is actually supplying the, the water in this case, could be any chemical, to the spraying drone. So this is a combination of uh, real-time image processing, some very simple uh, planning 
flight planning. Uh, our perceptive navigation doesn't require um, mapping out a detailed GPS plan. <clears throat> Instead, we teach the drone, <clears throat> excuse me, how to recognize uh, rows of vines. And it keeps track of the row it's in. And then when you say go over one or two, it knows how to move over one or two and then go back the other way. So it's now sped up to give you some idea of how this operates. All right, let me show you one other and then I'll take questions. So this is scouting on the same field on a nice sunny day. And the drone is flying um, one meter over the vineyards and tracking automatically. And you can see from here that we can see the drip lines, we can see the health of the plants, you know, looking left and right, you can see and it will go down to the end, move over and then turn around and come back. And the reason it turns around is the camera is on a gimbal in the front of the drone. And all of that is automatic. So setting this up, you simply say, here's the height I want, I want you to travel down the, between the two rows, you know, down the middle of a row and then hop over one and come back or hop over two and come back. If you're looking right and left, you can uh, avoid flying every single row. Okay, I'll stop with that and take questions. Come on. Incredible. No, that yeah. Bruce, I think that's a great example of, um, you know, having talked about a companies within within your category, how you encompass both, almost all tool sets, both you're using sensors, you're using a variety of imagery, you are using drones in this case as well. And then at the same time, you're taking a handful of information, putting it together and providing automated recommendations, which is a great, fantastic example of really the future of this category, which is great. My, my quick question I wanted to ask you, uh, but then we'll probably have to move on here as, um, for, for an individual farmer, uh, how do they interface with the Farmex? What is your what is the uh, business model that you typically go to market with? Is it is it just a subscription tool? Is it a by by service? Is it you charge depending on the types of sensors or an application or tool sets that they need? I'm just curious when you bundle so many things into one, what how does that work with an individual farmer? So. Um... We currently sell directly to uh, large growers, um, mostly in California, although we do have an installation in Washington and one in Arizona. Uh, we um, uh, offer two sales models a, as a service. You simply contract with us and we will put the, everything in and maintain it. You pay us a yearly fee and everything's covered, including maintenance and full access to the information for you and your staff. Um, or you can buy the equipment up front with the yearly access maintenance fee, more classical. Um, the latter is there because things like sweet grants require it. Um, sweet grants in California um, offer up to 200,000 per grower of uh, money from the state to improve water efficiency and energy efficiency. Uh, state Water Energy uh, Efficiency Program. That's what SWEEP stands for. And um, many, many growers, they'll hand out a few hundred of them each year. And it's free $200,000, up to $200,000 to install technology like ours. We've won you know, 20 or 30 SWEEP grants over the last few years. Um, that requires a sale upfront and a maintenance fee because SWEEP will not pay for a as a service fee. We're working with them, but they don't do that. They like to have the money budgeted, pay it, as opposed to have it spread out over five years. I understand. Um, so we, we sell the large growers. We're starting to work with um, distributors, uh, working with location uh, installers to take this technology to market. Our um, biggest backer so far is Kubota. Uh, Japanese company that makes tractors and uh, four by fours and other vehicles. And we are working very closely with them to produce a whole family of autonomous vehicles over the next few years. 
Um, and uh, they are just starting to introduce what we do to their dealer network, which is worldwide. And they may evolve into a distribution channel for us. Exciting. Well, Bruce, really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a little bit of time left, so I'm, I'm cutting the questions short here, but uh, fantastic presentation and, and really great example. I'm excited about Pharmax. And if obviously if anyone has questions, uh, we can see Bruce's email there, bruce at pharmax.co. Um, thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. You're welcome. If I can find the right screen, I'll try to <laughs> unshare. Maybe, uh, maybe I can help. If you can do that, would be great. If I can, thanks. All right. I think I fixed it. Um, yes. I appreciate it, Bruce. Thank you so much. Uh, we have, we might go a little bit over time. So I apologize, guys, but uh, uh, hang in there with me. We have two more companies that I want to present that are part of the, what I consider the forum network category. Both companies, I think, are really exciting um, as well. Um, and give you a different perspective on both imagery and management. Um, I think the approach that they take is more catered towards emerging markets and it's a lot more unique um, and practical for those regions. So first one I'm gonna have jump on is Usman. Usman, thank you so much for taking the time. I've known Usman for a while now. I actually am pretty excited about what they've done already within Southeast Asia region. Um, but Usman, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Kyle. Pleasure talking to you after such a long time. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, okay, super. Yeah, so thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, Board of Agriculture, for agriculture. So what we're trying to do is take uh, agricultural data and then build a credit layer on top of it to come up with financial solutions for a smallholder farmers in developing countries. A little bit about us, basically we're a data analytics company that uses AI and machine learning tools to generate and monetize actionable data analytics for the agricultural ecosystem, enabling it to conduct financial deals more efficiently and transparently. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with the problems that smallholder farmers face in developing countries, but uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective, about 83% of the total farm holes in the world are less than 12 acres and are categorized as small hold farms. And uh, uh, the biggest challenge that these farmers face is access to capital. And unlike the US where you have FICO scores and it's easier for banks to uh, determine the credit worthiness of farmers uh, in countries like uh, Thailand or Pakistan or Vietnam, uh, it's incredibly difficult for farmers to establish their credit worthiness. And what that does is that it excludes them financially from mainstream banking and they end up uh, borrowing from informal loan charts, which then ends up in an extremely exploitative relationship. So Recult is a social enterprise. We are headquartered in Boston. And uh, we have uh, operations in Pakistan, Thailand, and Vietnam. And currently, we're focusing on the South Asia and the Southeast Asia region. Uh, we were uh, recall 16 by four MIT alums, including myself. And we were also incubator in the program. Currently, we are completing a series A round. Um, it's, uh, and we do have space in the round. So if anyone's interested, we'd definitely be interested in talking to them. Our business philosophy primarily is that those who feed us need us. And our uh, primary um, focus is to accelerate the transition to digital financial solutions for farmers using data analytics as an enabler. Uh, we do have very clear cut revenue goals in terms of uh, uh, generating around $300 million by 2026 and uh, serving around 6 billion farmers in, um, in our, uh, through our platform. So I'd just like to give you an example of our primary customer, who do we serve? And this is uh, a picture of a real life example, farmer in Thailand, and she's been growing cassava for three generations, and she has to make 
suboptimal farming decisions due to a lack of information and financing to invest in high quality farm inputs and technology. And even though she can produce more, she has to harvest early because she cannot uh, afford payment for her family. So she harvests and loses 20% of her total yield. And this costs Pupa 20% um, of her net income and also 60% of her disposal income for the year. So this is a classic example of the kind of farmers or farms we're talking about. And um, uh, this is something that you'll see a lot in South Asia, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and to some extent also in Latin America. Our secondary customers are banks, crop processing mills, and input suppliers. And I'll just in a minute tell you how all of this integrates. Uh, but uh, coming down to the problems that we try to solve, one, as I mentioned, is financial exclusion. Smallholder farmers are excluded from mainstream financial products. And then information asymmetry. Again, smallholder farmers do not have access to near real-time prices and much information, which again, forces them to make some optimal decisions. So the solutions that we've developed primarily are based on sourcing data from multiple stakeholders within the agricultural value chain, including remote sensing, uh, banks, farmers, uh, mills, uh, and other input supply companies. So what we do is we collect data through uh, different stakeholders to either uh, a farmer app, which farmers can download for free, uh, either uh, through the iOS or the Google Play Store. Uh, and then we analyze and process that data through our uh, AI machine learning algorithms. And then we monetize that data by selling actionable insights to relevant stakeholders like banks, mills, and um, uh, input supply companies. So this is a win-win model for everyone because in return for data, farmers get access to uh, information like hyper-local weather, they get access to crop scouting tools, they get access to near real-time uh, pricing information, they get access to loans, and uh, in return, they provide us with data which then helps us build our uh, statistical yield, uh, statistical models like yield forecasting, like crop classification, like harvest detection, all, all, and all kinds of information which can then be uh, useful for stakeholders in the value chain. And this is again a graph, uh, another form of sharing what we do. Uh, you can see the different stakeholders who are providing data to us, like remote sensing and suppliers, telecom companies banks, farmers, and crop processing mills, and all of that goes into our platform. And then uh, it's monetized to service everyone in this space. Uh, the, the overall market is huge. Uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail here, uh, but uh, overall, uh, if we look at the primary market for both Pakistan, Thailand, and Vietnam, it's in hundreds of millions of uh, farmers. Uh, I'll quickly go over to the farmer app now. This farmer app, uh, this is a, these are some screenshots of the farmer app that we use. Uh, the farmers can download this for free. And uh, we have more than 800,000 downloads. We have covered around 2 million acres uh, of farmland, which is in our database and which we can use for building our crop models. We have uh, a fairly active uh, farm base as well. And all of this actually then helps us in building the net effects that are so important. In uh, then this is the agent app. This is the second uh, source of data collection, uh, which we provide to the field teams of the partners that we work with, like the banks, the uh, mills, uh, or food companies, and uh, the input supply companies and their field agents go out in the field and collect data, which then again is used to um, build the crop models or, or, or actionable insights that we monetize. And then the end result is uh, Recult X, which is our proprietary 
dashboard, analytics dashboard, and these are some of the examples. That's the kind of work that we then monetize. This is a yield forecasting model. This is a classification model that we share with different um, organizations. Uh, this is a, a credit scoring model, and all of then leads to us generating revenue through our secondary customers while servicing our uh, services that they need. So the way we make money is that the banks, the mills, the input suppliers all pay us uh, uh, a revenue and the farmer gets access to in-kind loans, uh, which is his biggest pain point and also gets access to uh, information uh, which helps him then improve his productivity and his income. So this is just uh, um, uh, a snapshot of our, of our founding team. We have four founders and all of us are from MIT. And uh, yes, right now we, as I mentioned, we are in the process of raising funds. We, uh, we, we have a space for another million dollars. So if anyone's interested, very happy to I guess that's it from my side, Kyle. Um, Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much, Usman. I really appreciate it. Uh, any any questions from the audience for Usman? And if not, uh, we'll probably move on to the next company just because we're already over time. But Usman, thanks again so much for sharing. And I think uh, what's exciting about your product is, again, what you're providing is you're targeting a massive set of farmers that have a huge need that needs to be fulfilled. It's really hard to reach those farmers in a way that's scalable, practical, um, because it's not like the United States or Europe where you can charge farmers themselves subscription fees or management fees or anything else. Uh, you, you definitely have to build out a tool set and, and uh, ways in which you can monetize as well as help the end customer. And also you're helping a lot of different agriculture stakeholders. So I think that's a really great example. Um, thank you, Usman. So the last company- Great, thank you so much, Pilot. Absolutely. Uh, the last company I want to get to is uh, Easy Agri. Uh, we have George, who's the founder and CEO. George, are you still here? Maybe here, may not be. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, George, I, I noticed the name is George William. Do you go by George? Do you go by William or is it George William? Yeah, so any. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining. The floor is yours. Um, George was uh, yeah. also a part of Easy Agric, is also a part of that farm network category. They're doing some really impressive things uh, within Africa. And so um, it would be really interesting to see a little bit more about what they're working on. So George, all yours. Sure. Thanks, Kai, uh, for the opportunity. Hope everyone can hear me, uh, but I'm going to take Kai's word uh, to represent everyone. So I'm, uh, I'm from Uganda. Uh, right now I'm in Kampala in, in Africa. So um, our solution, you know, the problem which you're trying to tackle, it's a little bit related to the majority of the solutions which you have had. So I'll not drill so much um, in that particular regard of the problem, but I would like to show the perspective of Africa. Right now, the, the core problem which is facing the continent is that uh, if at all someone doesn't know, right now Africa is producing over 320 tons of uh, probably cereal uh, crop, but it has potential producing over 800 tons, that it tons annually. That's three X, you're looking at almost three X to ensure. And the biggest gap why it exists is because of the yield, uh, the yield capability of the content, which is able to put value chains. And uh, the reason why it's like that, because of currently agriculture is predominantly dominated by smallholder farmers on the continent. And they are doing it as something there to, to just eat, and they're not doing it as a science. So they're not appreciating that actual agriculture is a science. So that's where Easy Agri comes in. So what we have done is that we have designed a tool which is able to, which is able to guide the farmers through. So our solution works in such a way that the moment the idea of farming comes into your head, then that's where Easy Agri starts from. So we have designed a very simple mobile app. Currently, it's running on Android because of its demographics on the continent. Uh, 
So uh, farmers can map their gardens just like polygons, just like the previous uh, uh, presenter from the group. But uh, also what is a group is doing that they can set pitch for each and the one to another piece of garden, then it's able to anticipate for them the possible cost of production and also tell them the possible use so that at least they can make a business decision or what you call a simple PNL uh, for their particular farm uh, since they're doing it as a business. Then from there, when production starts, we have integrated with over 60 input suppliers right now on the continent whereby they can, um, farmers can source directly from this input supply because we have a big, huge problem of counterfeit. And counterfeit is brought out by a lot of middlemen uh, in the supply chain that uh, who counterfeit the products of the input suppliers. So with us, with our technology, we, we assure the market of transparency to make sure that they're able, we are able to source these particular products from these owners of the products and they're sure of the quality. So from there, also they're able to get access to good agronomic information of how to use this plant, of how to use these inputs. If at all you talk about seeds, by inputs I talk about seed, I talk about fertilizer, I talk about crop protection, I talk about drugs, I talk about feeds, all that kind of things which are required to make sure that either you put on the, your livestock farm or on a, a agricultural garden. So what happens that uh, right now people just plant seeds anyhow, the way they want, not in line, not very organized farms like which I saw from Farmex, uh, I think uh, in US. Then now we are talking about people just throw seeds anyhow. They don't know how many seeds per hole. They don't know how else the spacing with, of the holes. They don't know how to apply fertilizers, all those kind of things. So we are packing simple infographic content, the infographic and image and a video so that they can easily relate to what they want to do. And in addition to that, uh, as they buy these inputs from Easy Agri, the app automatically captures them to collect for them farm reports. Because what we discovered that farmers always, uh, they care about which type of input they buy, but they don't care about the record of that particular input, which becomes a, a big challenge when they reach time to sell. Because when they are selling, they know the price, how much the produce is trading per kilogram, but they don't know their cost of production per kilogram just because they don't keep records and yet they want to do farming as a business. So I believe that if they want to do farming as a business, then there are some key business principles which you need to follow of uh, understanding your records, understanding your property, understanding all those kind of details. So from Easy Agri perspective, we are automating all those kind of workflows in a very simple way to make sure that we improve. And now what we have done is the last piece is that uh, we're in access to market. So we have integrated in off takers to make sure that they're able to trust the liquid from these farmers. And also uh, from this data, which you have generated transaction reports, agronomical practices, we know what they do, we know which content they access, we know what they bought last season, we know what they're going to buy this season. We have incorporated in access to credit uh, by us trying to make sure that we provide that given credit as microfinance institutions, which as for collateral. And sometimes they don't have this. Someone wants the hundred dollars, and a financial institution wants a collateral of over ten thousand dollars. So when they compare the two, they feel like they can't put their land as collateral because their land is so much valuable compared to the cost of production, which they really want. So as Easy Agri, we come in with that digital solution, which is end to end, airtight. That means that from the beginning of the season through the end of the season but also which is farmer centric in such a way that it's the solution for the farmers. It's a solution which belongs to farmers. It's a solution which really understands farmers and their agricultural process. So maybe your next question will be is that, so we understand that digital infrastructure penetration of the continent is low. So how do these, a lot of smallholder farmers get access to amazing technology. So what we've done is that we have two types of customer segments. So the first one here uh, is a smartphone farmer. So the, the lady up, so she has access to smartphone. She lives in semi-urban area or in urban area, or she has her auntie or she has her mother, whatever whom she's supporting, but she has access to a smartphone. She can download easy book directly from her phone and then she can use it. But then also down here, we have uh, our mothers who are in rural areas who don't have access to smartphone. 
So what we have done is that we have created an agent network, which we are called the agriculture, agriculture inputs merchants. So these are stockists, these are cooperatives, these are farm organizations in rural areas. So what happens is that we select young people, the youth in those particular groups uh, who are tech savvy, then we train them on how to use easier Greek, then they buy a smartphone and then we put easier Greek on it and then they start to transact on behalf of their members. So they're able to aggregate orders from their members uh, through one particular smartphone as they earn a commission at the end of the day from easier group because uh, it's still they're giving us more revenue and uh, more traction. So in that way, we are able to serve farmers who don't have access to smartphones. So this is just gives more detail around uh, uh, farm manager, how it works, our access to markets right now, how, how actually it works. Uh, and how we are making money, maybe probably to highlight again more how we are making money. When it comes to inputs, we make markup commissions from the inputs for every input which we sell. Uh, when it comes to extension or advisory, for us to give it up for free, we believe that it's a, it's a value added service and it's a right for every farm anyway to make sure that they access to extension. So farming records, mapping their gardens, all that particular data piece, we give it up for free for farmers. But also we charge these into off takers or the buyers or the mirrors, or you can whatever name which you want to call them or the exporters, we charge them for subscription fee to make sure that they access our platform to access the network of farmers. So that's our unit economics. Probably this is a very uh, profitable business because it's mainly automated and it's also aggregating the smallholder farmers. So someone who has two acres or 1.5 hectares of garden, for us, we are seeing a group of people, a group of farmers who have over 100 acres, which becomes, which creates more economies of scale and common sales of inputs and common sales of production services, like certain hiring services, all those kind of services, and also off takers because they buy big volume at the group. And we are able to benefit from the business perspective as a company from those economies of scale. This is our attraction now we have been uh, moving for the, for, the, for the five years. Uh, for all you consider from financial 2020, literally our business is as be as hard consistent 2X uh, revenue growth uh, from financial 2020 up to now. Right now I think about 2.5 million dollars being made per Adam. so it's and we are still seeing that potential coming out from the market because we are talking about we're not talking about a lot of mass farmers we talk about currently the farmers only have over 220,000 farmers on the easier grid. uh now comparing it to over millions and hundred millions of farmers on the continent we still believe that that's a drop in the ocean according to the potential of the model this that's a our team, we have a very robust team, both from an advisory perspective to a management perspective, people in FMCG background, engineering background, uh, talk about business, development, talk about our business. These are the kind of organizations which are partnered with the major ones across the world. We, are, we have a lot of global brands and so we have integrated to make sure that we're able to provide a robust solution to this one. Yeah, so even as we are raising, uh, we are raising uh, our seed of over $2 million. Uh, we want to make sure that we are able to scale our operations because mainly currently we are operating in, uh, in central Uganda. So we want to make sure that we scale into Western Northern Uganda and also start operations in another market in Kenya. So we, we are seeing this, uh, uh, this race to give us a run of 24 months. So it's currently ongoing and we believe that there's still space for one million uh, for any other particular person. So we are glad that at least if at all uh, anyone from the community can jump on board, make sure that we change how agriculture is being done on the continent. This is our roadmap for us to capture the African market. We have mapped out the key markets where we are seeing that there will be a lot of potential uh, for us based on the model and based on this potential to scale. Yeah. So. That's us. Uh, in case of anything, you can try to reach out to Kyle if you're interested, or you can reach out any of the contacts which are the rest of my fellow. Thank you, William. I appreciate it.
And it's also uh, a great to see your approach and perspective to smallholder farmers within Africa as well. Anyone from the audience, any questions? Also great presentation, William. You left everybody speechless. But um, this is great. Thank you, William, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, except uh, thanking you for the opportunity and probably can share my email address and uh, just in case people are interested. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Well, thanks everybody again for participating. That was the um, Agriculture Monthly VC event for Farm Software. I believe next month we might either do farm products or software, uh, but um, at similar time, basically the third week of, of every month on uh, Thursdays, we'll be hosting this. So thanks to all the those who attended today and thanks to all the startups that presented. Very excited about your products, which is why we highlighted you, but also I think the work that you're doing so far is pretty unique. And uh, at the product level, I think you're really innovating. So all of the, all the companies that presented today are really great. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions or interest in connecting with either the founders to talk today or any other company, just let me know and happy to discuss. But thanks all for coming. I appreciate it. Take care.